allow me firstly to bring greetings from Park University, from the Vice Chancellor, who would have been here and uh, is having to attend something else somewhere on behalf of the university, Professor Dionysius Kiambi. He sends his greetings. And the team at Park University, many, of course, who are friends of Park University, uh, not, sorry, friends of Park University, friends of uh, Deliverance Zimmerman, and who have been here, done ministry here, partnered with your leadership over the years, and people like uh, Dr. Wambugu Han, uh, my friend Thu Omburu, and many others. And actually in this church are also many members of our team there, uh, staff, and many former members of our team there who have influenced and shaped things for the kingdom over the years. Again, allow me to appreciate uh, the welcome and the ministry of Bishop Jimmy Kimani here. Um, and it's with great joy that I am happy to say he's one of the Park University alumni. And it's, it's just beautiful. Yes, 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 you may celebrate. I'd like to read our core text for today. And let me warn you that today is the next few minutes will not be, may not be a conventional sermon. It will be more of a provocative conversation, okay? We want to ask what is it that it takes, what does it take to be faithful in our season in passing on our faith to our children and to our young people in a manner that makes it effective for kingdom transformation? Judges chapter two, Verse, I'll read from 6 all the way to 14. Judges 6 all the way to 14. I mean, Judges chapter 2 all the way from verse 6. After Joshua had dismissed the Israelites, they went to take possession of the land, each to his own inheritance. The people served the Lord throughout the lifetime of Joshua and of the elders who outlived him and who had seen all the great things the Lord had done for Israel. Joshua, son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died at the age of 110, and they buried him in the land of his inheritance, Atimnath Harris, Harris, in the hill country of Ephraim, north of Mount Gaash. After that whole generation had been gathered to their fathers, another generation grew up who neither knew the Lord know what he had done for Israel. Then the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord and served the Baals. They forsook the Lord, the God of their fathers, who had brought them out of Egypt. They followed and worshipped various gods of the peoples around them. They provoked the Lord to anger because they forsook him and served Baal, and the Ashtoreths. In his anger against, his, against Israel, the Lord handed them over to raiders who plundered them. He sold them to their enemies all around, whom they were no longer able to resist. Whenever Israel went out to fight, the hand of the Lord was against them to defeat them, just as he had sworn to them. They were in great distress. We will pause there. They were in great distress. <laughs> this speaks of um, a transition that happened in the life of the people of God. It's similar to the other verse. Remember the one that says, then there arose a Pharaoh who did not know there are those lines in scripture I serve in the school of theology at Park University there are those lines in scripture that actually 
introduce a mega shift. It may be just a, almost like a line thrown in, but my goodness, the impact of it is, is like a, a complete change of course, change of direction. This is one of those, Judges 2.10, that is the one I will emphasize. Then there arose a generation that neither knew the Lord nor what he had done for Israel. And you're made to ask, if this was anyone else being mentioned here, I would understand. If it was, say, um, one of the priests, Harun, for example, or any others, it would make sense. But to think that this is happening after who? After Joshua? Sadly or gladly is my namesake. And after who? Caleb. You know who Joshua was? Remember the battle of Jericho? Joshua loved the battle of? For the battle of Jericho. You know who Caleb was? You know those two that brought back a report that actually emboldened God's people, although the majority had already cast fear among them? Those were the two that are mentioned here. As the people after whose generation, then there arose a generation that neither knew the Lord nor what he had done for Israel. That for me immediately raises a question. I have a problem with that. A big one. It forces me to ask, Joshua? Caleb? Really? How? Ajay. Yani after all Joshua did, Hati they would follow after them a generation that neither knew the Lord who what he had done for Israel. What happened? That is the challenge that I face. And the challenge is, not knowing the Lord is not just, it's not just that at you, at you, at you, at you, at you, at nothing happens, that you can just exist in a space where you neither know the Lord, know what happened, what he did for Israel, and nothing happened. There are consequences. And I want to take you through a few that we see in the verses there. Verse 1. Then I'll, we will ask, what does it mean for us? Eh? Verse 1. Rather, the first, first, first consequence, which is in verse 11. It says, the Israelites did evil as a result of not knowing the Lord, know what he had done for Israel. The Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord and served the Baals. Miungu. Number two. Second consequences. Verse 12. They forsook the Lord, the God of their fathers, who had brought them out of Egypt. Notice what it says there, and we'll come back to that bit. The God of there, yeah? it does not say they forsake the Lord, their God here, that generation. It was the God of there. Yeah? Somehow, God had been the God of mom and dad. God had been the God of uncle. God had been the God of, uh, they used to watch, something had happened that he had not become their God. We'll come to that again, as I mentioned in a moment. Verse 12. It's consequence number three. They followed and worshipped various gods of the people around them. And verse 13. They provoked the Lord to anger. Why? Because they forsook him and turned to the Baals and the Ashtoreths. We have consequence number four in verse 14. The Lord handed them over. Imagine the Lord who had, who had been a cover over them. The Lord handed them over to raiders who plundered them. The Bible categorically says he sold them to their enemies no longer able to resist. Verse 15. Consequence number five. The hand of the Lord was against them to defeat them. 
whenever they went out to fight. No wonder he says in the last verse, the last part of verse 15, that they were in great distress. And it says here, with us, so ever they went out, the hand of the Lord was against them for evil and to defeat them. So the Lord kind of withdrew the protection, the cover, and exposed them to defeat. That was the time of Joshua. That is what happened. That was, those were the consequences. Now, briefly turning to our own situation, our own reality here. As we ask the question, please be aware that this generation is arising. There was a background. There was a context. And these are the same people who had been instructed, Joshua and, his, uh, and Caleb and his generation, the people through the wilderness who received the law, are they not who, the ones who had been instructed in, uh, I think you should read actually, uh, Deuteronomy chapter 6, from verse 4. I want you to hear, uh, so that you understand my dilemma. Let me read chapter, Deuteronomy chapter 6, from verse 4. This is what they were supposed to do. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. And then what follows? These commandments that I give you today are to be upon your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down. And when you get up, tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. How then did a generation arise that neither knew the Lord nor what he had done for, given that background? And here, before I even mention some of our realities, it, 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 when I got troubled by this verse, now let me be honest with you, and now that my name is Joshua, I got thinking of that great verse we celebrate, eh? which is a fantastic verse, by the way. But let me mention it without, uh, I'm not saying you go and remove it from your houses. Joshua chapter 24 verse. 15, which says, Choose ye today who you shall follow, whether the gods of the, or the, where you are. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Could it be that that actually gives a bit of a diagnosis to why a generation arose much later? And here, be kind to me. I said today it may not be conventional. Be kind to me. Let me stretch your thinking a little bit. Could it be that in that verse, let me now step out of the pulpit so that I say, I say this here. Uh, you know, I teach public speaking, and what you say from behind there is very authoritative. What you say from here <clears throat> is safer. Uh, 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 Bishop, Eo. exactly. <laughs> Hallelujah. I like that. Uh, you know, I'm just stretching your mind a little. Could it be that Joshua in that verse is saying, up to you. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. That troubled me. Is that, is that what still stretching your mind. Is that what a good, responsible person says? Shaurienu. Mi nitachunga nyumba yangu. By the way, I'm not saying that's what Joshua was saying, but could it be that that is what actually the people had? Shaurienu. As for me and my house? If I were to say that, by the way, I speak this about this as a, as a father of a 18-year-old, a 16-year-old, and a 15-year-old this week. Okay? So I am greatly concerned that the things I treasure in terms of faith and, and values and character and mission and kingdom, will I have succeeded as a father if, if my children go haywire? If they def 
You hear my heart. Are my children safe if I say I don't care about what happens in our schools? I don't care what happens in our university. I really as, as long as I look at my, my house, eh? what happens in my neighborhood? Should it be our bother, our concern? Absolutely yes. Because unless your community is safe, your children are not safe. It's a lie. So now I say it from the front. Unless you seriously, vehemently, fiercely commit to engage for community transformation, kingdom community transformation, we are not safe. Yeah. We cannot afford any longer to say, just for me and my house. That's a lie. That's a big topic for another day. Let me quickly mention a few things here, then we will draw to a close. As I speak right now, right here, we are in an unusual historical season. I, and I think I can speak on this with a measure of authority. I have seen a bit of the world. In my few years, I have seen a few things. I have also had the privilege of being involved in church ministry and also in the university space for most of my life. Okay? I am now looking at the second half of life, so um, life begins at 50, they say. And, uh, and Africa, right now as I speak, we are the youngest continent on earth. Fact. Okay? Population pyramids, Africa is thriving on everything, anything. But hey, what used to be a problem, Bishop, has become a blessing. Eh? God knew, kind of. You know, population growth, mpango wa uzazi, I'm not saying msifaji mpango wa uzazi. But actually, reproduction, for us Africans having reproduced the way we have, I can tell you for a fact, it has come to serve God's purposes in this generation. So right now, Africa is the youngest continent on earth. You know what our average age is? Our mean age? Yeah? You can see. It is here. Yeah? And coming. It is 19 going low. 19.5 going lower. Actually, some African countries, that's Kenya, some African countries are as low as 13. Their mean age. We are, they speak on, spoken of Africa rising. It's actually more than that. This is like a flood, a mega wave in God's purposes. I'll tell you why. By 2050, 2050 actually isn't that far. It is projected that more than half of the world's young people will live in Africa. Why? The rate at which you are growing, the rate at which other places are declining, Africa is like accelerating right to the front. Can I tell you something else? Which is actually interesting for us urbanites. Do you know over half, over 80% of the African youth actually are in the rural machinani? That's where they relate more. We are only a few in the cities. For mission strategy, that matters. Why is this important? Because there are implications for that. If it is true, and it is, that the capital of all resources is human resource, yeah? human capital, then Africa, this place, I'm well, sometimes in Adarawigi, this place is actually at the heart of that. And you know, right now, we say the strength of Christianity is in the global south. Global south meaning? Actually, Christianity is now centered on the global south. And Christianity being centered and strongest in the global south, you have Asia, you have Africa, of course, you have South America, but the population dynamics of all other places that are in the global south and the religious distribution, yeah, in terms of religion, Africa is actually the heart of Christianity right now as I speak. And for your information, when it comes to Africa, not only are we the youngest, yeah, not only are we the center of Christianity in terms of future projections and strength and viability, we also, yes, have the youth, but something even, even better. When you come to Africa, in terms of young people and the future, I'll mention that in a moment, let me give you another point then, because that will make more sense. Um, if it is true 
the, the capital of all, human resource, of all resources is a human resource. Yeah? And if it is true, which it is, that the cream of the human capital, yeah? kerimo, kerimo, you know, you know, cream, <laughs> you know the, 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 the sweetest layer of human capital, if it is young people, then the cream of human, human population around the world is where? Hapa. Okay? It is here. And if it is true that the young people actually carry the heart of innovation and transformation, I can prophesy to you with my eyes open that the future of world politics is in Africa. The future of global uh, technological innovations. Who does, who, where, eh? Technology, internet, media, whatever, all those eh? communication technologies. The young people are leading. The young people are here. You know the big tech, global companies are aware. Kina Google, they are setting up here aggressively. And by the way, <clears throat> and I have to be careful when I speak about this, because I want our people here. Do you know there are countries right now, first world countries, which if you, if you apply for a visa to visit your friend for one week, they are now automatically giving you 10 years working visa. I should be careful, maybe I should not be saying that, Bishop. Many, I have seen it. They are trying to steal our people through the back door, our young people. Why? Because they know the future is here. The future of agricultural, I don't know, socioeconomic development, it lies with the young people, and the young people are here. So what's at stake is not just me and my family, me and my house. It's not just the future of Kenya. This is what I want us to understand this morning. It's not just the future of Africa. It's actually the future of the world, somehow by God's design. Sahi naongea. Amiwekelea mikononi mwanani? Mwa Africa. I feel like coming here, but let me still stay here. Because what I'm saying is still from here. Now, to my point I just touched on. In Africa, the way things are right now. By the way, what I'm telling you is backed up by research. Eh? I'm giving you a quick summary. There are organizations that actually have moved their head offices to Kenya. I'll tell you why. Global organizations, Christian mission, which study around matters, young people, and the future. It is this reason. Talking to them, they told me, one of them is called One Hope, that uh, yes, Africa is at the heart of it. But, and there are a lot of people across all of Africa, young people. Some countries are even younger than Kenya, especially some in West Africa. Kinanija and the rest, they are really young. But West Africa has significant instability. Nigeria, for example, has a lot of young people. But Boko Haram, Maraho, Mara watoto wa meibiwa kutoka shule. So it's a very unstable zone. Sawa? South Africa has a lot of young people. Because sometimes we look at South Africa and we think, oh, sisi wa Kenya. South Africa and the countries of the South have a lot of young people. But again, the consequences of apartheid, the consequences of the political divides and the socioeconomic incongruities, and they make it not actually, people not want to focus there, and the future is not very great in terms of their prospects. So the focus shifts where? To East Africa, okay? When we shift to East Africa, which are the countries? You know them, now they're expanding. Somalia is also part of East Africa now. Uh -huh. Tanzania doing great, but I have worked in Tanzania many years. The education levels are actually very low. Uganda, fantastic neighbor, but again, if you look at their politics and their socioeconomics and their, uh, my good friend Museveni, and yeah, he may not call me his good friend, but he's my good friend. So the focus actually zooms where? Into Kenya. People are actually looking at Kenya as the country that will shape the future of Christianity for the next minimum of 200 years. Okay? Minimum. Christ delaying. Why? Not only do we have young people, do you know, by the way, ours is one of the most educated populations in the world. 
in terms of youth and young people and skills, university graduates, joblessness, yes, but my goodness me, are our people skilled? Yes. Can our people work anywhere in the world? Definitely. Do they fit and flow and supersede anyone? Absolutely. So Kenya is not just another country we exist in. Right now, in the purposes of God, we are right at the top. I draw to a conclusion. My friends, how are we doing in terms of handing on our faith to our children, to the next generation? Because if we don't, these young people that are actually going to shape the world, what values are they taking? How have we formed them? How have we shaped them? Who is Christ to them? And since they're going to go out to the world, since they're going to shape things, what is it they're going to transmit? <clears throat> what is it they're going to transmit? And now we've woken up to this reality of the significance and the influence and the strategic positioning that God has given us. How might we influence them differently? In the case of Joshua, clearly, clearly, someone dropped the ball. Somebody broke the chain. Who was it that did not do what they were supposed to do for there to arise a generation that brought about such catastrophic consequences, of course, as according to what God had already said. When they disobeyed, consequences came. For us here, of course, scripture is very categorical. Second Timothy 2.2, uh, being a verse, that we should, this that we have received, the faith that's ours now, which we have received from those who are before us, we should entrust it, it to faithful men who will pass it on, faithful witnesses who will pass it on to others. How are we doing on that one? And when it comes to our responsibility as a people to pass on our faith, this, our young people, these children that we have or that we are going to have, who is going to train them in the ways of the Lord? And here, let me give you a disclaimer. I'm not saying that you, you get them to do things the way you, you did them. That you get them to have a hairstyle like yours or the one you wore in the 1960s or 70s or in my case, uh, uh, 90s and, and 20s, 20s, yeah? The generations that are coming, actually, every generation, this is my disclaimer, as you find in 1 Samuel 17, David and Goliath and Saul, every generation has its own giants. God does not change. The word of God does not change. My, my goodness me, do the tactics of war change? Do the weapons of battle transform and innovate according to God's leading? Remember what happened to Saul, briefly? When David presents himself, he says he wants to fight Goliath. He's like, eh, but where? Where are my armor? Take my sword and my shield. And Kajama could not even move. Even when he's walking towards Goliath and he picks up some stones and he has a sling, Goliath says, Kwani ni megua mbwa? Hati unikujie hivu? Isn't that what Goliath said? Am I a dog that you come to me with stones? Please, my friends, as we seek to pass on our faith to our children faithfully, gently, do not burden them with your weapons, the weapons of your generation. Every generation has its giants. It fights differently. In David's time, it was the Lord still fulfilling his word, but using a, an unusual weapon. Please beware. But for this generation, who is going to teach them these three things as I conclude? The great commandment, to love the Lord with you all. Eh? To pursue the kingdom, the greatest priority. Who is going to teach them the greatest priority? Love the Lord, eh? seek first the kingdom. Uh, the first one is, if you're writing notes, it's Mark 12, 28 to 34. That you shall love the Lord with your heart, with your soul, your mind, with your strength. And your neighbor as yourself. Who is teaching our young people to do that? Who will, is going to teach our children to do that and how? Second one, the greatest priority. Seek first his kingdom. Matthew 6, 33. 
who is going to teach them that? And again, for those taking, taking notes, Matthew 28, 18 to 20, who is going to teach them the great commission that you don't just live for us. There is more to the world than me. I would like us to pause there and I would like to call on um, Bishop Jimmy to pray for us as we close this bit. We will be continuing in the second service. And uh, what is it the Lord is saying to us? What is the Lord saying to the church? And how do we respond? Please, Bishop, come and pray for us as we respond.